going live in five, four, three, two, one. We are live. Thank you. So, uh, welcome everyone. And uh, this this week uh, we have uh, this tricky case of the month meeting, and we have four uh, interesting cases. We have uh, Dr. John Mukhopadhyay from Patna and Dr. P. N. Gupta from uh, Chandigarh, who both are ex. Uh, extensively experienced in this field and we thought that their presence would throw more light on these cases. We also have Anil Agrawalji, Ranjit Deshmukh and many other senior colleagues. Uh, we would take their help. So um, I would invite uh, Shinam to start presenting cases. And uh, we have current fellows, Dr. Shinam Bansal, she is from Amritsar and Dr. Meet Jain, he is from Mumbai. So they would present uh, one by one. Shinam, yes. you can please share your screen, yeah? Yes, sir. Please start. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present this case. Three years old uh, boy presented to us from a remote area of Rajasthan with difficulty in standing and buckling of extremities when asked to do spotted walking. We can see uh, he is not able to bear weight on uh, both lower limbs. He had no history of fever, trauma, or bowel or bladder incontinence. There was no history of night pains. He had uh, adequate milk intake. So uh, before we move ahead, Shinam, no, uh, Gaurav, you, did you look at the video of this child? Yes, sir. Dr. Gaurav? Yes, sir. And this is the history. What would come to your mind, you know, when you see this a child from your consulting chair chair when a father is tries to put the child down and he is not taking weight he is irritable and this is the history what thing would come to your mind she told there is something in the heavier uh, also some can you can you speak a little louder gaurav we are not able to yeah I think I think she she also said that there was something on the X-ray finding also she told some something on the tibia uh, upper part of the tibia. Did she told that? Sort of just I'm talk. Uh, uh, we are coming to X-rays little later, but these are the okay finding so, and this. Shinam, can you play that video again, please? Go back okay. to a slide. Yeah, and Doctor Anil Agrawal, this is uh, father is saying this is happening for about a month now. And for one week, child has stopped walking or standing, you know. Yeah, show the history, Shinam, and uh, Gaurav, what do you think this can be? So, uh, I would like to, yeah. So, so, I would like to rule out transient synovitis, one, by where the child is not bearing uh, weight. And uh, is there anything neurological which is Right. So, neurologic is one differential. Chinmay is saying proximal muscle weakness, unsteady gait, or any upper motor neuron lesion. That's right. Let's uh, see what uh, we found on clinical examination. Then we'll take uh, opinion from John and PNG. Shinam? Yes, sir. Uh, he was irritable while we attempt to make him stand. Reflexes were normal. There were normal sensations. Power could not be elicited because he was uh, very irritable and painful. So, John, what we should uh, think when we see such presentation? What things we should keep in mind? Yeah, know? so the possibility that the child's having, one is some weakness in the muscles. That's, of course, has already been mentioned. That he's not able to bear weight or he's having pain when he's trying to do that. So, those are the two things that you need to look at. 
and pain could be due to various things. It could be related to infection, trauma, some fracture or anything like that, which you have not, uh, or could be metabolic and caused because of some stress fracture type of thing. So we need to look at okay. that and look at weakness in the lower limbs for whatever reason, starting from the spine, uh, muscle paralysis, right. etc. So uh, there was, father was very uh, uh, clear that he did not have any history of fall. That's one. Okay. Uh, and his sensations were fine, like uh, he could uh, feel and he was retracting a little bit when we were touching it. And uh, the child was dairy intake being inquired and they said we are, they were farmers. So, and they had cows and so dairy was not a problem. So, these are the things and... Uh, then some more suggestion. How are the joints? So joints were okay. When child was not bearing weight, there was no problem with the joint. Muscular dystrophy. That's so we were we are talking in terms of uh, a neuro uh, neuromuscular issue or some trauma. Yes, Doctor Gupta, what do you think? Uh, what what it can be? Yeah. My feeling is that seeing the history and the examination, uh, the muscle dystrophies, they don't present with such a dramatic too early. history. Yeah, it's too early. Too early. Yeah. It's too early. Second thing, it's too early. And even if we think of some rare conditions, they don't present in a period of one month. Yeah. So I would narrow down to if it is painful, if it is painful some sort of viral myositis or something from the spinal cord like like right. uh, or some infective uh, you know, viral yeah. viral infections of the i mean yeah. like uh, this autoimmune viral uh, like transverse myelitis or uh, i mean yeah. something of that sort or dendrogonal virus syndrome or something of that sort right 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 so bansi says i have seen dmd in a 5 years old that's right but earlier on they have uh, this bovis sign positive they yeah when they don't are near, not able to stand that that is pretty late yeah shina move ahead and and, and show what uh, what is further oh, yes. so gbs gaurav is thinking as well we also thought the same yeah shinam again not so common at this age is it gillenberries gbs we see on and off okay. uh, uh, we see some Weakness and acute flaccid paralysis sort of picture. Now, this patient is coming from remote Rajasthan. So, uh, rarely we see acute flaccid paralysis also. Uh, I mean, polio, you mean? Polio, that is a rarity. We, we refer them right away to pediatrician. But these are the differentials which we thought, uh, as you all, show the list of differentials we thought, Sheena. Yes, sir. Now, what may be the differential diagnosis? It may be uh, Gullian Barre syndrome, as sir said. It may be acute neuritis or myelopathy, acute neuronal regression disease, spinal cord compression disorder, or it may be vitamin D deficiency associated myopathy. So, uh, as my wife is endo, no, we see sometimes ex very severe uh, rickets. Uh, and they sometimes present with uh, convulsion because of hypocalcemia. And sometimes those patients would present this way. So that was also one of the differentials. So the first thing we did was x-ray. Can, uh, can you show, Sheena, what is further? This was a, a x-ray uh, showing uh, both lower limbs. So, Bansi, uh, how would you, uh, do you find anything abnormal on this x-ray? Or Amitosh? Or Chinmay? Anyone can take this x-ray. I mean, this does not look very typical of rickets though. It's certainly it's really not. Great. Sorry? So, Dr. Anil Agrawal says this can be scurvy. So, scurvy may we see this sclerotic uh, margin along the epiphysis, Wimberg's line or something. Can you show the close-up view, uh, uh, Sheenam? Yeah. 
Chinmay says that distal femur looks sclerotic. Uh, Anil ji, what? Why? Why do you think it is curvy? What findings uh, you think? Sir, this is this areographs are typical of uh, curvy. What? What we see? Can you guide our fellows? Uh, this is not exactly typical, sir. The uh, features of a classical scurvy are you will find hollowed epiphysis with osteopenia. This one is the classical sign, the dense physis, the physial plate is the dense. Then there is the lucency avoid. After some time, if you give vitamin C, you will see a hematoma collection over here on the margins, which is not still present. And if you do lateral view, you can see other features as well. If this is AP view, in lateral view, you will have other features. And if you suspect it, then you have to look for other features like petechiae, gums, and other supportive signs, which will help in diagnose, confirming the diagnosis of scurvy. So this child did not have any petechiae all over the body, gums? Yeah, it's, not, it's not necessary. It's like yeah, just, scurvy, uh, has go, scurvy has got a whole spectrum. I'm just uh, telling you the clinical scenario. Yes. Uh, do you think this uh, there's a sort of increased shadow for the joint line? Is there some effusion or something in the joint? Because if you see, follow this, uh, yeah, I saw that uh, shadow, but that mm. might be just the cartilage shadow, and the overall knee joint was not looking uh, looking extremely okay. swollen. Is it swollen at all? Yeah, there was there was a bit of swelling, but not yeah. bit too much. Not to get and, uh, excited about. Do you think there is any periosteal reaction? I, I didn't find it any. I can't see any periosteal reaction to yeah. be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, so Bansi says non-identical changes. Malin. Yes, PNG. Uh, what, what I observed on the full length. Uh, Go back to full length x-ray, Sheena. There's a little obliquity in the pelvis, looks like. Obliquity in what? Pelvis. Okay. You see the pelvis is oblique. Right. But now I, I can tell you that spine was straight and the child was irritable in taking x-ray was moving. Oh. So there, okay. is, there is no either, structural either this oblique. Is, okay, positional or else there is something in the hip or spine which yeah, is... Yeah, I agree, I agree with you that, that left lower limb looks little higher, but this, this is just a child and there was okay, no okay. structural deformity. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Shinam, uh, further show what investigations we did. Go ahead. So, lab is <laughs> showing a bit of low hemoglobin and uh, a bit of lymphocytosis with normal count. Yeah. Move further, Srinam, and tell what. CRP was also normal. Uh, vitamin D and metabolic profile was normal. Patient was referred to a neurologist. Neurologist denied any neurological condition. And the nerve conduction study was also showing there was no evidence of polyneuropathy. So, uh, John... Metabolic workup is normal. Infective workup is normal. Neurologist has seen the child. There is no evidence of polyneuropathy or muscle weakness. CPK was also normal. So how to deal with this now? So uh, you've ruled out uh, vitamin C deficiency, is it? No, we, we, we have not. Uh, how would you uh, check? Vitamin C or, deficiency. Or giving him vitamin C and see if in, seeing if it helps. So we have not done it yet, but okay. uh, based on this, any other other than vitamin C, should we think anything else? Dr. Anil Agrawal says a trial of vitamin C. Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. That's why I'm attending. <laughs> but anyway, so... Uh, what, what about... Um, so there's no evidence of any trauma anyway. There is no history of trauma. Spine X-ray no, is normal. Uh, no effusion in the joints. No, no effusion, yeah. Okay. Then that's the only thing I can... Yeah, so then now the journal clubs help. You no know, health and the fellows, you know, they read a lot. So Sheenam brought this into uh, to my consideration that, sir, I read a paper on uh, uh, present day scurvy and scurvy. they have mentioned the children... Uh, 
present with such situation. Yeah. So, Shinam, show what you have done literature search. Show, yeah. This was published in Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics in 2021. Nine patients uh, were studied and uh, six patients were uh, presented with refusal to bear weight, like in our case. Yeah. And three patients presented with limping and knee pain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah think... Go ahead with other literature which you brought to my attention. And then these papers are showing these all uh, signs. Uh, Shinam, you can mention those uh, radiologic signs for all the fellows again. Okay, sir. Then we retrospectively check the x-ray and uh, we uh, see these findings. Cortical thinning was there. We can see dense band in the metaphysis and lucent band just above the dense band. And there was periosteal elevation. And it may be subperiosteal hematoma. There was marginal sclerosis of epiphysis. Yeah, so I, re I remember them presenting a few cases from uh, Vadias as well uh, some years ago with Alaric yeah. and all. They presented a few cases very similar. Although more florid than this. This is much yeah. less florid. So, so uh, but you know, this... Before this, I did not know that we can uh, we can do any testing of ascorbic acid. And then I inquired okay. with our pathology colleagues. Hmm. And only one lab in Ahmedabad is doing ascorbic acid estimation. So I said, let us, uh, one way is as Dr. Anil Agrawal said, you just give the vitamin C and you will see dramatic response in a week. But I said, uh, for academic purpose, please do this test free free for us. And the lab uh, uh, pathologist called me back that we are not able to assess any ascorbic acid level. <laughs> this patient is having significantly deficient in vitamin C. So this Anil, Anil is because it was not neglect or mental, but these patients are from very remote area and uh, their diet is also compromised. Probably that might be the reason of uh, this deficiency. So, Shinam, show further how, how we, uh, the lab markers came. Then vitamin C came. Uh, it was non-undetectable. Yeah. Yeah, and move ahead. So, it was uh, diagnosed as post-vitamin C deficiency pseudoparalysis. <coughs> And so we started vitamin C 500 milligrams one month. And we can see now the child can bear weight, can stand. And the x-ray also, uh, it was normal. There was no sign of scurvy now. <clears throat> this is a close-up view. We can see now there is no elevation of periosteum. There is no uh, sclerosis of epiphyseal margins. And no uh, cortical thinning is there. Now uh, the child can walk, can run also. So as Dr. Anil Agrawal said, I inquired the father that in how many days you saw the child has improved. He said in 10 days, when we gave this uh, medicine, in 10 days time, child was walking. So yeah. this vitamin C deficiency that I have seen very few cases in my academic career and uh, I'm mm. sure that young fellows would benefit from this uh, presentation and you uh, you just give LIMC trial and they would improve. So that was an eye opener for us. Yeah. yeah Sheena. So the take home message is pediatric orthopedic surgeons should have increased awareness about the diagnosis of scurvy when consulting on a child with the inability to walk. Heightened awareness is needed to avoid unnecessary surgery, unnecessary tests and procedures and to be able to start treatment for a potentially fatal but easily curable disease, like in our case. Right. So, Sheena, you can stop sharing your screen and uh, Meet, you can start with yours. Uh, Gupta ji, any piece of uh, comment or advice on this case? 
uh see basically it's it's very very uncommon actually yeah and we really don't see scurvy in my part of the country usually i mean uh, in chandigarh we really don't see scurvy <laughs> not even from people around and i had the opportunity to see only one case which was a very overt case with lot yeah. of sub periosteal hemorrhages and even a pathological uh, separation of the uh, i mean i think there was a that's right but you know fractures. i think we, it was a fracture yeah, yeah. i'll not remember off and now this was long time back so this yeah, was actually referred from uh, the pediatric department surprisingly so, you know so, after this case uh, john and dr gupta i found two cases in one more yeah. case this vitamin c was non measurable the third case just came uh, yesterday and their x ray findings have war uh, of uh, this bartons disease you see vitamin c and uh, vitamin d deficiency so the reports would come and i'll share with all of you so in last one year i saw three such cases so uh, maybe I think, I, I, this is a case which is i think eye opener and perhaps uh, yeah. in some of the yeah. cases with uh, some non specific uh, sort yeah. of symptoms so sometimes like this, this uh, we should start looking for yeah i think it's uh, it's important to be aware of its existence and look for it where you're not yeah. sure about and when metabolic problems or dietary problems are r- r- rampant around the country in children so it's nothing but definitely is something that you need to look out for and it's de- definitely a good message yeah. and one thing which i would like to tell young fellow that uh, when the jpos come you know just go through the titles and then sometimes you will uh, find out an interesting uh, paper which you would like to go through so uh, these are the uh, you know literature search sometimes helps yeah meet proceed uh, so good evening everyone uh, so the tricky case of the mandal i'll be presenting is an unusual and neglected taller head plus a medial malar structure so we have an 8 year old male child uh, who fell from a uh, height of 10 feet 25 days ago and sustained an injury along the right ankle uh, primarily he was immobilized by a bone setter for 3 weeks uh, following which uh, he uh, due to persistence of the swelling uh, he went to an orthopedic colleague and who further referred to uh, referred the patient to us for further management so on examination what we found out was that there was global swelling over the anterior and medial aspect of the right ankle other sensations over the dorsum of the foot were intact there was no pain on passive stretch there was no visible clawing of the toes and the toes were well perfused so we got an x ray done and uh, this is what we found so uh, before uh... john i i mean you you are the best person to <laughs> tell us about this sort so, of injury so before coming to you know i'll inquire with other uh, pediatric colleagues that uh, how have you seen such pattern of injury in your practice where we can see this uh... yeah our... yeah john you can guide us yeah, about so we so basically you can see that there's a fracture of the talus with dislocation of the subtalar joint here yeah. so, and uh, a medial malleolar fracture as well and there's a fracture across the body of the talus as well and the neck so you can see there's a uh, yeah. coronal as well as sagittal plane fractures there so you're going to need a ct to uh, to find out yeah more detail and, and uh, there is a small uh, comminuted piece also which we can see on the yeah, yeah. anterior to yeah, yeah yeah so that's that's from the neck but what you are more worried about is the subtalar joint right so now this was 3 weeks oh i mean 25 days old and uh, this is presented to us yeah me move ahead any in comment from anyone else yeah so for me it was for the first time we we saw such uh, uh, injury pattern yeah so we went ahead and got a ct scan done as john sir just said and this uh, this was the 3d cuts of that ct scan so uh, john how would you did you help in your 
previous findings or you want some further cuts? Uh, so can we have the so the three D tends to give you an overall picture but hides the details. So I would really like to look at the other sections. Yeah, if you please, uh, meet show. So the cuts that we have, uh, the other cuts are here. We have yeah. uh, the sagittal and the axial cuts. You can see the plane of the fractures kind of goes across and then back. So that's why you're seeing two planes to the fracture. Yeah. So you've got a sagittal as well as a coronal section injury there. And uh, you have to probably approach this from, sorry, let's not jump the gun. Okay. So, yeah. So I think even in a child, even though it's late, uh, this is an ankle that's going to be wrecked otherwise. So you have to try and do something. So Dr. Kishore says that he, he had uh, an opportunity to fix such one case. So Dr. Kishore uh, is a uh, general orthopedic trauma surgeon from Surat. How, how would you approach this, Dr. Kishore? Yes, good evening, sir. Good evening. So I did the same case at the uh, patient who was 14 years of age. Okay. It was missed by primary orthopedic surgeon. Mm -hmm. And I, this case, uh, 10 days later. Okay. 10 days later after the injury. So how, how would you approach this? Uh, I opened the fracture through the anteromedial approach. And okay. the medial malar fracture was used as osteotomy. It was yeah. a natural osteotomy. So I can see the whole talus in front of me. Then I fixed with the headless screw, Herbert screw, yeah. and mm -hmm. the medial malar was fixed, sparing the physis with uh, one 4 mm CC screw. Uh, well, uh, all right. here, like, uh, you know, uh, it's a type 3 Salter Harris fracture. So, John, would you like to go through medial malleolus or you would do something else? So, I would do a dual approach for this. So, you go lateral and medial. And okay. since the medial malleolus is fractured, I would make use of that to extend my approach. But uh, I think uh, that's, you have to get good visualization because you have to reduce the subtalar joint accurately and right. also the talus as accurately as possible. So without, a, without yes, vision from both sides, it's going to be very difficult. Right. Yes, uh, dual approach I did. But the, just to confirm the reduction only. So I have not okay. put anything from little side. Just to check subcolor and the alignment of the color. So uh, I did the dual. So the question is, uh, uh, John, when this commutator fracture, how easy it is to put screws across, or it that will derange the, or you so should how, do something. How old is the child? So these are 10-year-old. So you, you don't have to, you don't, even if you put screws, you don't have to compress, okay? Okay. So you can use uh, headless. Uh, so you what I use in these are the 3.5 uh, locking head screws. Yeah. So you can bury into the cartilage, countersink without having to make a big hole in the cartilage as opposed to the 3.5 or even the 2.7 millimeter headless screws. So they work more or less like threaded K wires, having right. a better hold than K wires. Okay, so the important thing is to get it reduced, hold it with wires, and then put in pins uh, into in these screws wherever you feel you can put them without disturbing the cartilage and the joint as such. So it's like working out, putting all the wires, getting everything together, and then putting your screws after that. So temporary fixation and then definitely. Yeah, meet, uh, move ahead and show what uh, what was done. Because you see this, this, sorry, can you just come back to the last one? Yes. Go back to this. So there's also a depression here. So you need to also deal with that, okay? Yeah. So very often there's an articular impaction which you have to lift up and then also get that corrected. Yeah, so yeah, we, we faced all those issues and... Yeah. Uh, we, <laughs> We had our one adult uh, trauma colleague who had more understanding than my, me in this uh, area. So let, let's show what uh, what uh, thought process went through our mind and what we did. Yeah, me. 
So as we discussed, uh, the diagnosis that we reached was a closed community fracture of the talus body with a Salter Harris type 3 medial nervous injury with uh, normal distal neurovascular status. So what uh, the, pro the problems and the challenges that we faced were threefold. The first was the precarious blood supply of the ten, uh, talus bone. The second was that it was a 25 days old fracture. And the third was that the commuted uh, pattern of the fracture. So just to uh, recap the vascular anatomy of the talus, uh, it is uh, the talus is a, uh, it has no muscular attachments as such. It has uh, multiple nutrient foramina in the uh, neck region. And the uh, blood supply is usually uh, is mainly from the deltoid branch of the posterior tibial and the anterior tibial artery, and they are perforating uh, peroneal branches as well. So the questions that we had about management were uh, there were three main uh, questions that we had: that should we intervene or observe? The second was that if we do intervene, then what approach should we have used? And the third was that which implant gave us the best possible fixation for this type of fracture? So in this paper uh, by uh, Bruce Sangerson, uh, it, uh, it states that displacement as small as 2 mm, they significantly alter the contact characteristics of the subtalar joint. So this, uh, this simply states that uh, even a displacement of 2 mm is significant and needs to be uh, fixed to avoid uh, degenerative arthrosis in the long term. Uh, we went back and uh, in this paper by uh, Sermet in our letter, uh, they, we went back to see the mechanism of the injury. And uh, it, uh, on doing a proper literature search, we realized that uh, this type of injury had been described before and that it was a forced extension injury at the ankle with some supination component, which uh, the supination component led to the malleolar fracture. So now let's, so now looking at the CT, uh, what approach should we ideally use? So here, uh, th there are multiple approaches to the ankle. There's the anteromedial, antero anterior, anterolateral, a posteromedial and a posterolateral approach. Uh, on doing a literature search, we realized that uh, uh, what we needed was a, a, a clear access to the talar dome. And uh, it, uh, we found out that this paper uh, by uh, Laura and Lambert, which was published in 2013, uh, it was it's the trans ligamentous approach to the talar dome. The uh, what they have described is that in a they have taken a 26. Uh, this study was done in cadavers, and they realized that in 26 of them, when they used this approach, they found that the ex percentage exposure of the talus uh, talus bone was 77 percent as compared to the others. So with all the other four soft tissue approaches, uh, they could access only 76 percent, whereas using this single approach, they managed to get 77 uh, percent exposure. So moving on to the implant options, uh, we uh, we referred this pay, uh, paper uh, by the Journal of Foot and Ankle Surgery. This was published in the year 2020, and uh, they said that uh, open for open reduction, uh, whether an adult or uh, a child, uh, we could uh, uh, the use of a mini fragment plate or a headless screw could always be used. Uh, there's no uh, there's no problem with uh, using either of them and uh, the approach that we use for the talar neck fractures is very similar to that the principles of fixation are very similar to that for a talar body fracture so uh, this is uh, the intraop image uh, we used a mini fragment plate set and uh, this is the approach that we use the lateral transligamentous approach so john here like uh... So after exposing it and aligning the uh, fragments and making sure that the subtalar joint is well reduced, uh, we took a plate from mandibular plate set, yeah. and then we then we contoured it, and this has a provision of two point seven uh, uh, locking screws, yeah. which we placed in the head. And uh, so we've used th there's actually a tailor plate available. In yeah. The when looking, we've used those quite often on the lateral side. On the lateral side, there is a non-articular portion where you can put a plate. Yeah. Uh, we even have put plates on the medial side, but we generally prefer screws. 
it's important to do this on the lateral side because otherwise when you put in screws on the medial side you're going to compress it into varus the talus into varus right so uh, this was what done and after that we went on the medial side to fix the medial malleolus but so, I, i would always use k wires provisionally to hold things yeah that's okay. what that's what we also did and then we checked under image intensifier and then uh, we went on putting this plate yeah so uh, this was the introp image that we could uh, achieve and uh, we have fixed the medial malleolus by 2.7 uh, mm screws and the uh, uh, tell us by a mini fragment plate the man from the man mandibular plate side so you didn't do anything from the medial side not from not anything from medial side we just placed this plate so it would have made sense uh, my my uh, thing is that how could you uh, assess the reduction of the medial aspect of the body so there's the pre op exactly. there seems to be some depression and would you did you do that uh, intraoperatively from the fracture area or you can't do it from the lateral side it's impossible yeah yeah so so this fracture so, area did you actually reflect the fracture downwards and evaluated the talus or you relied on your radiograph so we we relied on the image intensifier and uh, we also saw that with this provisional fixation the subtalar as well as ankle joint was well aligned and then we fixed and then we check with the uh, stability after fixing the uh, medial malleolus so in medial malleolus we just hold with a towel clip and brought it down there was no frank mobility i could uh, lower it a little bit and then we fixed with the epiphyseal screw and anyways we had to kind of immobilize this child in a plaster so we thought that this is a kind of adequate fixation and just so, there is a question uh, john said that you should put a bone graft john would you put bone graft primarily in such fracture no not always it depends if you have to support an articular cartilage which is without support yes but yeah. what so put, here the articular cartilage was fine yeah but the there was a bit depression little distal to that but i would like to put axial screws so from anteromedial yeah. along the, so because you have a fracture line which is going across as well okay so that, that we, would, we could in, have added that that i yeah I yeah 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 primarily we were worried that it might get varus collapse no once but, you put uh, the plate here then the it's plate, not going to collapse yeah that that's right and we were also worried that we it took a little i mean to mobilize all this in place it true it's not easy i mean i agree after 25 days it's not easy so and of course we explained to the family that uh, it will need uh, it might go for avn not because of operation but because of primary injury itself right uh, show the follow ups uh, uh, yeah. yes so this was the immediate post of x ray as you already seen uh, this was the three week follow up that we uh, got when the patient came for yeah so if you look at the lateral yeah this is it's slightly good. yeah and it looks like as if it is it has collapsed a little bit exactly yeah okay yeah. let let's see one more x ray and uh, you can comment better now this is uh, at 6 weeks follow up mm-hmm. now there is sclerosis of dome yeah going into avian yeah but child has uh, almost kind of reasonable range of reasonable motion reasonable range of motion of uh, ankle and subtalar joint and we allowed him to walk with a ankle foot orthosis what would you do now if we see this talar dome sclerosis uh, should we avo- ask them to avoid weight bearing or what to do so uh, what we tend to do is to put them in a ptb orthosis yeah so they are offloading the ankle to some extent okay not totally not non weight bearing now so what uh, we have prescribed an afo and the child is A- moving mm. afo, AFO might not st- uh, offload it enough yeah 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 molin would you consider um, intraosseous my... zolendronic acid i i i don't think and I, i don't have any experience of injecting zolendronic intraosseous 
Do you, yeah. uh, have you tried John or Gupta ji? I've tried it in the neck of femur. Yeah. Of femur, okay. but not not in the talus. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, this I mean, this child I've, was a I've very. I've tried it from... only once in a in a femoral neck where it was early, but I really don't know the results. I mean, and I mean, uh, the... here, I think the 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 problem is likely to increase. And yeah. Irrespective so... of whatever you do, I think they're going to end up in a ankle arthritis eventually. No, but you. I'll be surprised. You. I, I've seen a lot of these Taylor fractures which manage for a long time before they end up in trouble. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they don't. They they I take would, a long time, but a lot uh, of these avians also, which are very, very very difficult to eventually salvage this uh, ankle. Yeah, that's okay. But Sometimes you, you know they revascularize also. So we yeah, they do. Ask, so you get the uh, they, sign and they yeah. revascularize. So yeah, yeah. So we show the final. Uh, now this patient is also not coming to us. You know, this from remote place, they have neglected it for pretty long time. Meet, show the follow up how he's walking. This so, is you. yeah, you can see he's from a village. Is this is how he's walking? Not walking too well at the moment. And, and this is how he's walking with the for the video. But we he will come soon for the follow up, and then we'll update you how it will sure. goes. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah, thank you. Yeah, Shinam, can you present your uh, next case? And uh, John, any any advice, piece of advice for youngsters? No, I think so. I think most of these Taylor fractures today, you have to use two approaches. Okay, almost all of yeah. them now, except for the yeah. very simple undisplaced fractures, because yeah. uh, you go medial and lateral. Uh, you often first stabilize it laterally, although you get both your reduction on both sides. Yeah. But because you don't want when you put the screws on the medial side, very often it compresses it into varus. So either screws or a small plate on the lateral side, and then screws on the medial side cross the neck because usually the neck is also involved. Here it's right. like a neck going into the body. So for right. the body patches, you have put you have to put screws across the body usually. So so they vary okay. a lot. I think the a, but the subtalar joint is also going to be a problem here because that was comminuted as well and displaced for a long time. So, so it's yeah. a tough case and I think you've done very well, uh, but obviously the prognosis will be guarded. So this was a bad case to start with. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, Kishore, Kishore raised his hand. Kishore, what do you want to comment? So transligamentous approach has a limited indication. Right. The paper, the, the paper which was shared that I have read and they have used for osteochondral defect. Okay. Uh, this is used for just the post medial corner of the talus. Yeah. Here we can see the to the anterolateral approach. This fracture can easily be visible. So right. unnecessary, we can avoid the injury to ATFL. Because once we go through the transligamentous approach, one has to repair the ATFL uh, perfectly. Otherwise, later ankle instability is out. Right. Yeah. So we 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 re repaired. I mean, sutured those things back, but we'll be careful about this. And Doctor Nimish uh, Patel was with me while doing so. That was he uh, his suggestion. Anyways, let uh, Shinam share your case. Let let's start with the third one. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Forty-five days old uh, girl presented to us with reduced movements of the left leg for twenty-five days. She was born at full term by normal vaginal delivery. There was history of NICU admission on second day of life for four days due to neonatal sepsis. There was no history of any constitutional symptoms, any uh, history of fever or failure to thrive. On examination, her uh, left limb, lower limb, resting in flexed uh, position. There was no apparent swelling. She cries on a passive extension of left knee and hip. And uh, this is the radiograph showing lytic lesion in the metaphysis reaching up to the epiphysis. So sometimes this happens, you know, like uh, the child is skipping the knee flexed and as the child flexes, the knee, the hip also get flexed. So this 
in this child before coming to us or before coming to diagnosis two times hip ultrasound was done and the child was uh, treated like this there's just uh, uh, you just this might be synovitis or something but because the hip x-rays and hip sonographies are normal so uh, dr anil agrawal how how would you uh, deal with this case it's now case of, yeah it's a case of chronic osteomyelitis involvement of both epiphysis and the metaphysis right because right. the child has a neonatal infection right now uh, we have to assure uh, we have to find out whether the infection is active or not second thing we have to splint the limb to prevent any secondary deformities so mm -hmm. if any cultures were available at the time of uh, nucu admission mm -hmm. we will rely yeah. on that it don't i don't think that the infection is quite active right now it's basically a sequel so we have to just follow up the child serially the child is too small 45 days only so we have to follow the child immobilize the child initially followed by gradual mobilization and keep the child under follow up for longer periods probably at 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 3 months we have to get the x rays so or 3 to 5 months 6 months we have to get that but this child had uh, significant pain you know when we try to extend the extremity the child would cry a lot so uh malin, so that that malin, was a issue malin, yes dr gupta ji yeah malin my approach would be to see whether to assess clinically uh what clinically whether the infection is active that means if it is painful if there yeah. is a swelling which is yeah. like a fluctuant swelling if we are able to appreciate clinically or if none of them is appreciable if the child has pain that means there is something going on there mm. some activity is going on there so i would evaluate using ultrasound and if that doesn't pick anything i would not hesitate to go in for a mri right and of course the lab parameters so and now the, the issue if, was this child was uh, 45 days old a uh, icu uh, nicu admission bit of immuno compromised and the child has the community acquired uh, like infection right from day 4 yeah and yeah. what, uh, what and i have observed in uh, molin what i have observed we do, do see such like cases quite frequently yeah what we observe in these cases is that most of the times by the time the patient reaches the orthopedic surgeon but most of the cases i'm not saying all they already have been loaded with antibiotics and you are really not left with any drainable abscess yeah so then in those cases you go in for further imaging mm -hmm. go in for further imaging yeah and uh, evaluate whether uh, uh, you know if there is uh, something which is tapable or drainable otherwise mm -hmm. you have no choice but to rely on your lab parameters with total count differential count and yeah. cp and esr to to decide whether to continue the antibiotics as far as yeah. the bone destruction is concerned if there is nothing drainable i would just like to observe this child and lot right. of times you know everything uh, grows back into mm -hmm. pitch the family was concerned that this child's pain is not going anywhere i mean the child is remaining painful with every diaper change child had pain yes john yeah so for me i looking at this uh, i would go in for exploring the knee and draining it out because the, right. uh, many times you've found it and even if it looks as if it's settled down when you go in you find a lot of uh, sort of debris and necrotic tissue yeah. and, all. and until you take that out it just festers on for a long time so that's that's my approach also because you have and, to drain it you have to find out which bug it is yeah and they exactly. need antibiotic uh, uh, specific antibiotics after that and once you do it they settle so rapidly it's unbelievable so usually i can't say always but yeah so raman says that the hip joint also looks uh, swollen so we got hip ultrasound which was normal raman and gorav yeah, says at least us i, I felt tried. that the hip looks little out of the place but that no but if you look at the shenton if you look at the shenton yeah, yeah, it looks fine, like yeah. the positional uh, this thing yeah yeah, yeah. So the so hip is still like to yes i i, I agree with uh, yeah. i would still yeah. like to and yeah. we got the knee ultrasound gorav as you you mentioned so shinam show that knee knee sonography and they found there was a fluid collection so that there was 
with so, internal echoes and both on the metaphysis as well as the epiphyseal side and the joint was clear but it was abutting to the growth plate yeah uh, that's what was reported and which we can see on x-ray as well yeah and there's a doctor anil say the lab parameters were also not very raised because child was immunocompromised yeah dr raghavendra says drainage and drilling of metaphyses should be done so that's what we did shinam go ahead we did uh, decompression and drainage by a medial approach and uh, it came out to be mssa antibiotics were given according to culture report so were you able to uh, drain any abscess there or any necrotic tissue yeah yeah there's yeah, yeah there there was abscess in the metaphyseal okay. side yeah, yeah. and and uh, on the epiphyseal side as well but i made a window in the i could okay. see that my blunt probe was going through the physis into the epiphyseal yeah, that is a frequent uh, yeah yeah so that was drained it was cleared and lavaged and we gave anti iv antibiotics few days at my clinic and then to their uh, remote uh, pediatrician child did well there after actually yeah yeah shinam move ahead after one year and nine months the child presented to us with genoverum deformity of the same limb mm. his mom was very uh, you know very uh, alert Observed. and she used to call me that sir one leg is uh, going out and the other leg is straight <coughs> and the first time i said okay we'll we'll see when you come in follow up and after a few months she said now the one leg is going out and the other is going inside <coughs> and so I, i said you send the images and then they came to see me and uh, as you can see now the left leg is going into varus and she now show the x-rays and now uh, we can see there is teething of the physis and so, uh, so presumably uh, molin you have warned the parents about this yeah and i i i did tell this. i did tell them that now that this the infection which travels through the physis might have already affected the physis you know it, it might have already injured yeah. but the parents have selective hearing and they were very happy <laughs> with the uh you know as the child was febrile uh, gaining happens weight again and again so anil ji how would you manage this uh this thing now sir the child is still young one year yeah. one year and nine yeah, months yeah one year so would like to wait at least for a few years see the okay. pattern of so see the pattern of the deformity sometimes they are not as aggressive as seem however this seems to be causing deformity i would like to intervene around age of 3 years after getting the necessary imaging okay, post okay. infective physial bar have a notorious course they usually right. don't right. they are not like post traumatic because the whole of the physis is abnormal right so you, in traumatic types the rest of the physis is normal only the affected part is abnormal but here because the other physis is also normal even after if you excise the bar the deformity yeah, yeah. will continue to reoccur so in most of these cases a compensatory osteotomy and a contralateral growth modulation is always required and you have to retain that growth modulation for a longer time so i would i choose a age where growth modulators can be applied easily right. that is around 2.5 to 3 years of age so so we have thomas palikran here thomas are you with us No. Thomas. Okay. So uh, let me inquire with uh, Dr. P N G. Would you have the similar approach of just wait and watch for now, or you would like to uh, do something at this point? One point nine years old boy, a uh, girl with progressive uh, varus. Gupta ji, or John, you can, uh, you can. Yes, yeah, so I, I mean, we just did one on an older child with a ankle, very similar sort of history, but it was in the distal tibia. Yeah. We did a 
growth plate uh, where we took out the bar and put in some fat and things like that. And we are waiting to see what happens. Uh, I agree with what Anil said in terms of the prognosis, but I think uh, as soon as you think is okay enough, you need to map out because it looks like a small bar. At yeah. the moment. And I would uh, maximum maybe document progression because you've got one and maybe see one more to document that it is progressing for yeah. three months, not necessarily wait for a long time before doing it. Because so think, anyone else uh, have any other or approach or comment before we move, move ahead? And, and you would also obviously have to put a uh, growth modulation on growth the Growth modulation, yeah. So any anyone, Gaurav? Uh, I, would, I would also like to break uh, you, you would like to wait, yeah? But I have a similar case and I'm waiting. <laughs> so how long? How long would you how wait? How long would you wait? I'll just see the progression for another yeah. year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Progressions uh, sequentially, yeah. maybe for a year, and I'll see if, if it progresses, then I'll, I'll do something. Talin, uh, you're at Wadia. How would you approach this? Talin, do you have any uh, difference of opinion or you would uh, agree with what Dr. John said? We have a comment. Uh, there is already... Uh, uh, can I... Can I... Can I yes, yes Gupta ji. We were Colin, waiting for uh, Basically, we need to see whether the virus is coming from... Looks like coming from the bar. Yeah. But whether it is really due to the bar or due to the previous destruction of the metaphysis. So I would image this for the... Uh, you would image with an MRI? MRI. Okay. And evaluate if it requires a growth plate surgery or not. I would okay. not wait for a very long period of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is what I said. Yeah. Agreed. So and there is a, one... a... growth modulation. Right. So there is one comment that looks like there is already shortening of couple of centimeters. Would, wouldn't it require a lengthening of the growth <laughs> modulation in future? So yes, uh, limb length discrepancy, Puneet, we will need to address. But currently, our goal should be to correct the uh, the deformity. And if it is a bar which produces the deformity, we should try to correct it because child is young. Otherwise, but as Dr. Anil said, that post-infective bars are uh, excisions are not as reliable as we see post-traumatic bars. Yeah. So Sheenam, uh, move ahead and show what. So we did an MRI and uh, as Dr. Gupta ji said and yeah, Shinam say. A coronal text test uh, view showing six millimeter square size uh, of central bar involvement and uh, axial physial mapping uh, representing 8% of the total distal femoral uh, physis. So now, uh, uh, again, looking at this MRI Gupta ji, what would you uh, do? Would you go for bar excision? Now, can you say that this is this virus is from metaphysis or from bar or we can see a clear cut bar here? Yeah, see, uh, Malin, uh, I would say uh, this bar is more or less central. Okay. You know, a bit eccentric. So it's very, very difficult at this point of time to point out whether this is really from the bar or uh, it's from, from the uh, uh, metaphysical yeah. uh, so destruction. At yeah. the most, I mean, this looks like to me central bar. And this can cause a sort of a volcano appearance of the growth, uh, growth plate, which actually you see on the radiographs also. Yeah. So right now it's very difficult, but this bar perhaps is uh, doable. Because this is just just around uh, eight percent. Now, now so let's let's consider that, the, that this virus is coming from metaphysis. Okay, that virus is coming from metaphysis, but the bar is there. Would you excise it and give a chance for child to grow normally, or you would just do growth modulation? Uh, Malin, can you repeat that, please? So let's. Let's agree with you that uh, this virus is not from the bar, from the metaphysis. 
but yeah. we know that the central bar leads to limb length discrepancy it tethers the growth yeah. plate yeah agreed agreed so should not we uh, give a chance of um, gaining length that's my question yeah, yeah agreed i i would i would yeah john I would. yeah, yeah i would uh, like i said i would do that i'm not sure how successful it would be but i'd certainly do that and put a growth modulation and growth modulation yeah i agree prevent you you want to prevent progression of the deformity first and limb length is something is not so difficult can be dealt later yeah. so uh, gupta ji in your experience what amount of deformity you correct acutely and what amount of deformity you will prefer growth modulation see this particular the cora is at the growth plate and it is a growing child so it is easily doable by a growth modulation i would do a growth modulation I will, I will not do. correct it acutely in this. Yeah. So the current literature effect. says if the deformity is more than thirty degrees, then you should correct it. But less than thirty degrees, I'm unable with growth modulation. So yeah, Shinab, Malin, show uh, the. Yeah. Malin, let me let me share something with you. Yeah. I do not know what this thirty degree thing uh, actually means, but uh, I'll tell you. I had a patient who had around twenty degrees of vulgus. Yeah, did a growth modulation, and lost to follow up, and ended up in a about twenty or twenty five degrees of varus. Yes, yeah. So that means the the epiglottis <coughs> actually moved around forty degrees. Okay. So I think it all depends on the age of the child. Yes, by and large, I would take thirty degrees as a, a cut off point, but the potential of the uh, remodeling may be more than thirty degrees, provided the you have sufficient growth remaining. Right. This is my experience in about three or four cases during COVID time, especially. Right. Yeah. So Shinam, show it. what uh, we studied further and what we did for this case. This is a paper by Langen Skyall, provided that its size doesn't exceed the half the cross section of the physis. Normal growth can be restored by inspecting the bridge and filling the defect with fat. This is a publication published in Journal of uh, Pediatric Orthopedics in two thousand six. Uh, it discussed about uh, or arthroscopically assisted central physial bar dissection. There were total of thirty patients and thirty two procedures were done. in which uh, there was a poor results in three patients who had infective etiology out of 30 poor results uh, the limb segment after resection had growth ranging from 0 to 12% and there was 14 degree mean angulation uh this paper was published in journal of pediatric orthopedics in 2020 they have discussed that uh, there were five patients total uh, in the study and two were uh, two out of the five were having neonatal sepsis there was infective path pathology and there was good results in both uh, these two cases and one case uh, didn't response and it had traumatic etiology So now this this paper is representing our case post neonatal sepsis uh, uh, central physial bar, and they treated as John we discussed that uh, you excise the bar, give a trial, and then do growth modulation. And so we also opted to do that even though the child was only twenty uh, one months old. And uh, show Shinam the re result and outcome of this child. so we resected the bar and growth modulation was done this is a post op x ray so we did this we removed the metaphyseal plate metaphyseal window we approached the bar with the help of dental burr and scoop you should do it put a fat there and then you can put that cortical window back in position and then so that uh, it doesn't become very weak and of course you do growth modulation that that's what done yeah show the follow up x-rays after 6 months implant was removed because the deformity got corrected as you can see 
after 9 months of bark season we can see uh, the deformity is well corrected in fact over corrected mild valgus is there so i opted to wait for the uh, the deformity go in little bit of valgus and then to remove the plate so that uh, if it rebounds then it's okay yeah show the uh, further slides now uh, we can see she walks like uh, this these are the x rays after 9 months of recent follow up we can appreciate there is mild limb length discrepancies there but deformity is well corrected yeah go to the comparison x ray shinam yes so john now what i see is uh, although i have excised the central bar there are two small bars at the periphery that might be tethering the length and that's why the shortening is happening but if uh, the child does not develop any angular deformity then then at least we have saved the child from multiple uh, deformity corrections you know now we'll have yeah you are mute john so, sorry and you know there's growth happening because otherwise it wouldn't have corrected yeah there's exactly no, no growth it may be tethered to some extent but yeah. there's some growth so hopefully the discrepancy won't be a huge amount if there was no growth you wouldn't get correction with your that, modulation that's right yeah dr gupta ji your comment on this i'll agree with john that uh, if the growth uh, if the correction has occurred that means the bar has gone actually so this i think this needs to be observed over a period of time i don't think so this will reform because this is just a x ray appearance appearance i mean i would uh, just observe the child so it about it's about 6 months i have removed the implant and the, it has not gone the any the other way that's good so now we we'll, we are dealing with the discrepancy and and i'll, I'll I keep you updated I, i think the discrepancy needs to be observed over a period yes, of time yes 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 if it if, if it gets worse then you can you know yeah. further evaluate the patient meet can you share the last uh, case slides so what i learned from this is uh, that we should try to in young children especially we should try to resect the bar whether it is infective or uh, traumatic but if it it is less than 30% and if it is uh, in a young child we should always give a shot now i have seen such results in two three infective bar patients also so yeah meet go ahead so molinger uh, yeah, yeah, just yeah. before we start i may have to leave in a short while so just excuse me yeah, i so just so we will quickly go through this case okay, sure. and uh, yeah okay yeah, so the next case that we have is a post molin i'll just uh, make a two minutes leave Okay. Yeah. So the next case that we have is a post-infective ulna gap non-union. So we have a six-year-old boy. He's a resident of London, UK. Uh, three months after his birth, his parents noticed uh, swelling and uh, redness around his uh, left forearm. So uh, they consulted a general surgeon in the UK, and uh, what they did was a debridement of the forearm. Uh, the debridement of the forearm wound. and along with prolonged iv antibiotics uh the, however the discharge uh, persisted and the patient at 3 years uh, uh, by an orthopedic surgeon there was iliac crest bone grafting done for the same and now uh, however the graft unfortunately got resolved the uh, dis- however the discharge gradually stopped and now at 6 years the patient has presented to us with deformity of the left forearm on examination uh, as we can see in the uh, picture on the left side there is a shortening of the left forearm uh, along with an apparent cubitus varus there is also a, a, a uh, there's a, a, a apparent cubitus varus deformity and uh, to see the the way we, we can see the increased bowing of the radius there's a prominent radial head however the range of motion if uh, the range of motion was full and there was no distal neovascular deficit Uh, so we got the x-rays done for this patient and uh, these are the comparative views of uh, the left and the right forearm
so like uh, before john and uh, gupta ji le- leaves yeah john how would you approach this six years old and no uh, no infection in recent past for last three years nothing was done mm. this is x-ray yeah so there's a very little of the proximal ulna there but what we have done in a few is to convert it into a single bone forearm is to fuse the proximal radius with the ul- ulna remnant and then correct the deformity as well so uh, yeah. that gives you much better strength uh, obviously uh, you're not going to get a normal ulna at the end of it so i would yeah of not get do to um, get too ambitious and do something like that rather than molen uh, gupta I... ji what would you do yeah. but i might wait this for is... some time before doing it yeah. this is a ulna which uh... seems non reconstructed okay right so but his elbow joint is on that sorry i can't see that so i think i'll agree with john that uh, a single bone forearm is the best choice i have had the opportunity to do two cases In best okay. position would be a mid uh, prone position in this particular patient right so the elbow also the elbow joint the proximal ulna also doesn't the articular surface looks little Yeah, that's uh, what I'm a bit worried uh, about. So that's yeah. How so stable clinic, is the elbow? Yeah, the really? elbow is stable. He could do good uh, elbow flexion okay. and extension. Although X-ray looks bad, the child had reasonable range of motion. So, Meet, let's let's go through what we did, what we thought. So, uh, and, as we can see uh, on the findings, we can see a resolved mid shaft ulna. There's in, uh, increased in the in the radial inclination. Uh, there is a sclerotic proximal end of the ulna and we can see a few bony islands and there is a disrupted uh, distal radio ulna articulation so the problems and challenges with the case were again threefold there was a loss of the mid shaft ulna there was a forearm shortening and there was an increased radial inclination so what are the ops the the options that we had uh, we could think of osteogenesis using Ila- elizaro method uh, or we could have done a bone grafting with an impl- uh, along with an implant or or the single bone forearm as or the single uh, single yeah. or the single bone forearm yeah so uh, in this paper uh, this was by anil agrawal sir and uh, it was published in the journal of hand surgery 2020 uh, they stated that uh, all patients had a painless functional limb at the time of final follow up the shortening the average shortening was uh, around 3.9 cm with a preserved elbow range of motion However, forearm pronation, uh, forearm rotation, especially the pronation, was severely restricted in two patients. So the uh, we uh, on going to literature, we found another paper which was by uh, which was uh, again uh, but published by uh, Sandeep Patwadan sir, uh, reconstruction of bone defects after osteomyelitis, and uh, it stated that uh, what uh, this paper what they have done is uh, after osteomyelitis they have used a non vascularized fibula graft in 26 uh, 26 patients and this was uh, done in the femur tibia and the other forearm bones as well so uh, when seeing the forearm bones we can see that the time to union they did achieve union in almost all the patients and the time to union was uh, 40.7 weeks and the other thing was um, the average defect in the forearm was Six centimeters and not yeah, more than different. this. And here in this case is about ten to twelve centimeters yeah. defect. So this yeah. was a more challenging uh, uh, case. Yeah, Meet, go ahead. So the challenges in this case were that we had to uh, do a radial bow correction. We uh, we had a, a small proximal ulna segment, and the distal ulna was uh, absolutely thinned out. So uh, what we performed. we planned for a radial osteotomy a lateral uh, closing wedge osteotomy and uh, we performed this using the uh, radial inclination of how much we had to correct then uh, the uh, site of uh, the ulna the sclerotic edges we clear we cleared uh, we cleared those we harvested a fibula graft and uh, then uh, we uh, fixed it with a we fixed it with a, a nail and along with that we for rotational stability we kept a fixed it for some time Yeah, so John, this is uh, what we could achieve. You know, we I placed in diaphyseal plate to correct the radial inclination, mm. uh, removed the sclerotic ends, uh, took the fibula and the small uh, K wire. I placed and then uh, placed the 
monolateral fixator elisa uh, the iliac crest and some cancellous bone graft and uh, applied the plaster and i told family that this may go for uh, it may not unite and then we might have to resort to something else but this is a very young child so i wanted to give a trial of this and uh, the show the follow up the uh, meet yes so this was the follow up on 15 days this was a two and a half month follow up and uh, we can see that the osteotomy site has uh, united well and the uh, ulna the fibula graft that we had kept is also uniting okay can you just go back to the first x ray go back okay. yeah because uh, I, because there's the ulna at the distal end also seems to have grown yeah which is yeah surprising go, go back uh, go back to the, to the even earlier. go back to the first x ray So there seems to be so, such a hypertrophic ulna here. Yeah. Go go on. Go back. So now come come to your follow up one. Yeah. Now. So, fo so this was the three month follow up. This was the most recent follow up that we had. The radial osteotomy osteotomy site has united well, and the fibula yes. graft has also united. So even the distal ulna seems yeah, to grown quite well actually. This is hypertrophic, yeah. <laughs> like because it was so thin earlier. Yeah, so they, as it is said, you no, know, once it gets under pressure or aligned, that starts going. So it uh, very quickly, fortunately, it, uh, uh, the stipula was in, taken up very well on both the ends, mm -hmm. and uh, child is doing. Child is currently at UK, and they they sent me the videos today. So Neet, can you show that? Excellent. So this was a three months follow that we had, and uh, uh, to motion. look at that, yeah. this was how the patient was prior to the surgery uh we can see that uh, he he cannot pronate his uh, left forearm well mm. and this is what we have achieved at 3 months flexion extension is achieved so he's moving as thing at the shoulder isn't he so pronation is not yes. there but we i so, i have just immobilized him in a supination because that's a functional position left hand yeah yeah and he is doing pronation from the shoulder yeah but uh, otherwise cosmetically and uh, he he looks pretty well yeah so i've i've done quite a few fibula grafts in my life and somehow i have close to only around 50% good success on both sides so yeah, yeah so i have uh, sort of uh, been a little more wary of doing it but excellent result no doubt so bansi says so why do people go for uk for but they i think the post infective bone loss experience is what mm. we we have, have more is than... much more yeah yeah okay uh, molin i'm sorry i have to leave yeah, so thanks thanks Did john you for it? your okay. uh, no no uh, presence and uh, just give a final comment to the fellows and then we'll we'll continue. no i think I, i think this was a group of excellent cases with uh, very good learning points so i think all i mean forget you guys we've benefited from it so i'm sure you would have benefited from it and so thanks molin as usual these meetings are good and uh, always lot of things to learn from it so keep it going that's all <laughs> Thanks. Right. Okay. Yes, Dr. Gupta ji, thanks for your time and final uh, comment. Thank you. Wind up. Thank yeah. you. Nay, I think these are very, very interesting cases and uh, very unusual cases and very, very challenging. And mm -hmm. I think at the end of uh, the day, it's important to identify the pathology and uh, uh, it's important that uh, as far as possible try to reconstruct the anatomy as far as possible. I think that's the overall message which I would wish to. I mean, conclude from this, but these are very very challenging cases and uh, should be I mean uh, should not be taken up by the people who are uh, I mean especially the last case I would have actually considered a single bone for him. So very nicely done cases. So thank you, thank you very much, Gupta ji, for your time and thank you everyone for your time. Yeah. Uh, hope we'll thank meet you. soon. Uh, we have uh, brachial plexus journal club next
Thursday with Dr. Alain Gilbe participating from France. So that will be an interesting session too. Take care. Good night. And Sheena and Meet nicely presented cases. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.